Okay, well, thanks for coming from near and far. Everybody feel free to pop your info into the chat if you wanna introduce yourself. Um, I'll also try to keep an eye on the chat as our presenters are going today, but they are gonna stop a couple of different times for questions, but you should feel absolutely fine about um, chit-chatting there if that is helpful to you. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Associate Director of the Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative here at Plymouth State, my colleague, Martha Burtis. Thanks, Robin. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and share my slides. Um, and let's see, can you see those? We're good? Yes. yes. Um, so yeah, the title of today's um, presentation workshop program is um, Meaningful Self-Assessment. Um, and I had a lot of fun putting this together. I cared really deeply about self-assessment as a, as a teacher. So it was you know, a topic that's kind of near and dear to my heart. And I have been wanting to do something around it for a while. I'm by no means an expert in this topic though. And so I just wanted to share that when I was, was researching, putting together resources, I learned some interesting things, which is that if you Google self-assessment, almost everything you find has to do with workplace self-assessment which I actually found super interesting because so many of us have to do some kind of self-evaluation or self-assessment as part of the workplace. And so I think it's actually kind of interesting to talk about that continuum of how teaching students to reflect upon themselves in the classroom may actually be a valuable work skill that they draw on someday. The other thing that I learned is that in England, self-assessment is something you do that's related to taxes. I don't know what, um, I can't explain it. Um, it got, it really got in the way though of my research. So I'm kind of angry that that's what they call whatever that is, self-assessment. Um, but to dive right in, um, I wanted to talk about why we would even be considering self-assessment. And a lot of my practice in this um, area comes and is um, situated around the concept of ungrading or alternative assessment. Some of you have attended collab events about ungrading and there's lots of buzz on the, um, the internet teaching and learning circles about alternative assessment and ungrading. And certainly self-assessment is situated within that practice, but it isn't necessarily all about ungrading. Um, other reasons why you might be interested in incorporating some kind of self-assessment activities into your courses, into your teaching might be because you were really interested in focusing on um, learner agency and, and giving your students agency in the class in terms of their own learning, the, the choices that they make and, um, and their ability to reflect upon those choices and talk coherently about, um, about what they've achieved or where they've stumbled. The other is um, an interest in process focused teaching and learning, um, which really is about um, seeing learning less as about final product and final grades um, in some cases, but where you're really, um, you're really interested in letting students explore kind of the metacognitive stuff that goes on in learning. Um, I always find that I, I, I learn a whole lot more about my students when they talk to me about their process than I do when I look at their product. Um, and so for me as, a, as an instructor, as a teacher, process-based um, learning is something that is really kind of near and dear to, my, dear to my heart. So these are just three reasons why self-assessment may be on your radar. They are obviously related and can overlap, but not necessarily. You can have self-assessment as something you do in your class and not be an ungrader. Um, you can do ungrading and not really focus so much on process in your class. Um, but I wanted to just kind of introduce those as, as guiding um, concepts or principles behind this. Um, so why is this titled Meaningful Self-Assessment? Because obviously that was a deliberate choice on our part. Um, I think we've probably all experienced times in our lives um, where we've been asked to self-assess and there's no consequence to it, right? I know that for years in my previous job, I did self-evaluations um, when there was no money. So like there were no raises, there was no, there was no, um, there was no demerit, there was no um, mer or, or reward for whatever um, came out of that evaluatory process. It's really hard when you're in a situation like that to see self-assessment as being meaningful, right? It can just feel like a hoop that you're jumping through, um, jumping through in, in order to kind of get something done. 
But it isn't even just about reward. It's also about meaningful feedback um, when you do self-assessment and it feels like it's just going into the void. Um, and I would posit that a lot of our students have probably had that kind of experience with self-assessment, um, maybe in K-12, maybe in other college classes where they've asked to do self-evaluation, but it doesn't really feel like it goes anywhere. Um, not just that it doesn't, it's not reflected in their grade, but they don't feel like anybody's listening um, and it's not um, coming back to them in any way that, that feels very important. So while I don't necessarily think that everything we ask our students to do should be responded to individually um, and with the same kind of uh, intensity, I do think we have to situate self-assessment within some kind of um, understanding of feedback. Um, whether, and sometimes that feedback might be a student providing feedback to themselves, right? Sometimes that self-assessment may be um, a more of an internal tool that you're having students use. So the other thing I want to talk about is that the very nature of self-assessment. So asking someone to truthfully talk about how they're doing, what their goals are, what they have learned, what grade they think they've achieved, asks for a really um, specific kind of vulnerability. Um, and that acknowledging that vulnerability, one of the ways we acknowledge it is through feedback and conversation, right? If we're gonna ask people to be vulnerable and honest with us about what they have done well and what they haven't done well, it not only feels meaningless when we don't respond to that, it just feels kind of rude <laughs> um, and not terribly kind, which I think is something that we, you know, kindness is something that I think we should try and foster in our relationships with our students. But you should not just take um, my word for this. Uh, let's see if I can actually get slides to work. Um, this is from a, a presentation by Jonathan Glazard a few years ago at a conference. Um, the, presentation titled Student Perceptions of Self-Assessment in Higher Education. And in his research, he found that students generally did not value informal opportunities for self-assessment. They saw little value in assessing their own work and they saw assessment as the responsibility of the lecturer, of the teacher and not of themselves. Um, so a lot of this is about how we um, position the self-assessment activity within our course so that um, we kind of decenter ourselves as the final arbiters of what's good and what's not good, of what's success and what, what looks like success and what doesn't look like success. Um, and instead we start to um, take students through a process where they really can, can, can take some ownership um, for their own successes and their own failures as well. Um, but if you don't like research, you also should just trust the memes because those are where real truth lies. Um, and this probably is what a lot of us worry about when we talk about self-assessment, which is that students will be like, oh, great, you're going to do a self-assessment. Sure, I'm going to be really truthful about this. Um, and then what they're basically going to say is that they've done everything perfectly and they've done a great job. And you should, if you're doing ungrading, you should give them an A. Um, or um, this one, which is... <laughs> You know, you ask them to self-assess and they're like, I don't really know what that means or how I'm doing, but I'm sure um, whatever I'm doing, I'm doing it really, really well. And so, you know, there's this fear that when we when we go through this kind of activity or process with our students, it's not only going to feel like um, hoop jumping for them, but what we're going to get out of it isn't even going to be meaningful. Right. Um, it's just going to be um, kind of an act that they go through. Um, it's also kind of interesting to, to unpack this idea of like how good we are, people actually are at assessing themselves. Um, is this a skill that we actually um, like innately are, ha have some, have some you know, um, skill at, at being able to objectively look at our work and, and explore how, how well we've done or haven't done. Um, this is from um, an interview with David Dunning. He's a Cornell University psychology professor who really um, studies this area a lot, particularly in, in the employment sector, right? Like looking at self-assessment that happens um, in the on the job. Um, and he says, on average, an employee does tend to think that they're well above average and they have more expertise. They have more leadership skills. They're more idealistic. Um, they're more sophisticated. Um, but, says Dunning, it's important to be able to correct our tendencies towards unrealistic optimism, and the best way to do that is by regularly soliciting honest feedback. Um, Dunning says successful organizations usually institutionalize a process that encourages vigorous critique. Um, so again, this is about the situating of self-assessment, about not letting it just stand on its own, but thinking about it as part of 
um, this conversation um, that we are in with our students um, and how we can how we can position this work so that it feels meaningful to them. So what are the, is there a couple of words that have been thrown out here? Meaningful, which is the title of this in, um, in that original um, study um, from Glazard, he talks about how students didn't value um, informal self-assessment opportunities and Dunning talks about the need for vigorous critique. So what do we mean by meaningful? If we're trying to be meaningful, we're trying to be formal, we're trying to be vigorous. Um, so a couple of things that come to mind for me that I would like to throw out there. Um, the first is about um, signaling importance to students. So how do we do that? How do we signal to students that this work that, that we're asking them to do with self-assessment actually matters? Um, so I would say we signal to it to students by centering it in our classroom in really important ways and incorporating it into the formal structure of our course. So it's not a throwaway, it's not an afterthought. It's not something that comes up unexpectedly to students. It's something that we talk about from day one, if it's something we're gonna be asking them to engage in. Calling it out on our syllabus, providing information about how it will work and why it matters, having a meta conversation with students about self-assessment and why it's important to us as teachers and why we ask them to do it. Um, and really introducing it in class as a topic of conversation and discussion. And from there, I think revisiting and reiterating. So it's not, you introduce it on the syllabus day one, and then you never talk about it again until week six when they do their first self-assessment. Um, and then again, until the end of the semester, or maybe you only talk about it one more time. Um, so we don't do, we shouldn't do self-assessment just one time, but come back to it repeat, repeatedly, mention it when introducing other work in the class, right? Talk to them about the fact that they are going to be assessing themselves um, at some point on the work that they're about to do. Remember to think about how you'll talk about your work on this assignment in your next self-assessment, right? Having a conversation with them about what that what might look like. Um, and also be open to rediscussing it during the semester if students are struggling with it, right? So if you go through your first self-assessment and what you get back isn't really where you wanted to be, that's an opportunity to um, invite a conversation into the class about what how that worked and why it maybe didn't work as well as you had hoped. Um, using formal tools to structure self-assessment. So not just having an open-ended, um, you know, single question and students submit a document, um, but thinking critically about um, what are the questions that you want them to respond to? How do you want them to respond to them? In what form? In what kind of, how much length are you looking for in those responses? Um, not leaving that really open-ended. Um, and not just, you know, give me two paragraphs about how you're doing, um, but instead, um, consider um, really structuring that experience for them, especially when they're first starting out. Um, in my experience, what I've seen is that students very often will start using that structure. And by the end of the semester, what I get is more like a letter <laughs> um, because what's happened, what's emerged is really a conversation and they've started to, to glean that. Um, feedback, which we've always talked, uh, already talked about, so always providing feedback, and that can take lots of different forms, and we can talk about those in greater detail, but um, consider the self-assessment. I like to consider it as the kind of opening parlay in a, in a conversation, in an ongoing conversation with my students. So I always tell students when I um, introduce self-assessment that if I have concerns about anything that they've shared, I will ask them to come talk to me, right? That this is not the end of, of, of this um, activity, this is the beginning of this activity is, is what they decide to share with me in their self-assessment. And then following up with comments on whatever they've written, asking questions in my comments to get them to think more deeply and following up with face-to-face -face student meetings whenever I feel like that's necessarily. And then keep our eye on the prize. So I think this is really, really important, which is that ultimately the point of self-assessment isn't about rating students. It is not about teaching students how to rate themselves. <laughs> um, some, unfortunately, the way we teach, it, we care about ratings and grades. That's part of the structure of our institutions. But really what this is about is about developing a culture of metacognition and self-reflection in our institutions and in our classes. And as I said, maybe even something that they take with them into the workplace when they're asked to do this kind of work in other areas of their lives. Um, the real goal of teaching here is to help students develop into self-regulated, self-aware and adaptive learners and self-assessment should be about getting them to articulate that learning 
so that they understand themselves as being capable of self-regulation, self-awareness, and adaptive learning. So I think with that, we are, I'm gonna turn this over to Liz, um, who's gonna talk about self-assessment in the wild um, with classes that she teaches here at Plymouth State. Liz, would you like to unmute, introduce yourself and get us started? You know, I would probably prefer to stay muted, but for the group, I will unmute myself. <laughs> um, uh, hi, I'm Liz. I have been here at Plymouth on um, the faculty for about you know, going on 20 years. Um, and I teach in the English department and I teach primarily writing courses, primarily creative writing courses, but also composition and other sort of expository-ish writing classes. Um, I, my preface always, when I, whenever I'm like trying to write or talk or like present as an authority on some sort of pedagogical thing, I always want to give this caveat like everything I, I think almost everything I do as a teacher, I stole from somebody else. I don't remember who, but I did. Sorry, like I'm not, I didn't invent any of this. Um, and uh, any building I've done on it, like anything I have done, like that I, you know, might be new or interesting is just on the backs of other people. And I like that about pedagogy, but it also makes me very nervous when I'm like, here's my brilliant idea about pedagogy. like, no, I have no ideas. I just copy other people's stuff. So author's notes are something I've used in writing classes. And again, that's like 97% of what I teach is writing classes. Um, but I think you can use them in all different kinds of classes. Um, and uh, I already don't remember whether it was grad school part one or grad school part two. There were two sort of intensive comp and rep programs in kind of different comp and rep programs that I uh, encountered in grad school. And in one of them, I'm pretty sure it was at Nebraska that I was, uh, that the practice involved this use of author's notes. There were other, there are other places that have history, and this has like been for decades now. And there are other places that sometimes call them learning letters, which I think is interesting. Um, and um, what I mean by author's notes is a paragraph or many accompanying a writing assignment draft. Um, in general, the author's notes ask the writer to describe what they're handing in. Um, tell me what you've got. Like, uh, and, you know, is it brand spanking new? Is it the 57th draft and you're so done with it? Because, you know, both of those extremes can impact like the kind of response you might find most useful and want to direct a reader towards. Um, and sort of your goals, a check in on your goals and purposes in the writing. So I set out to try to X and here's what I think, here's how I think that's going. Uh, here are the new questions or I set out to you know, write about X and now I'm not doing that at all. So also they asked writers to describe what kind of feedback they'd find particularly helpful in this particular draft or piece. Um, I require most writing assignments I give to be accompanied by an author's note in order to be considered complete in my sort of green light grade system. Like you do it, you get a check 100%, however you need to describe that to yourself. I like the green light metaphor. And in terms of, um, meaningfulness. I think um, the regular, the regularity of these helps them become meaningful. And I think what Martha was saying earlier about like um, starting a conversation. So at the beginning of the semester, I have, I have written up, I think I have it linked uh, and a later slide is just a Google Doc with my sort of standard, most recent standard. Here's how you write an author's note. And it's got a bullet list. And when I talk with students about this document and when we sometimes we talk about it in the author's notes themselves, I imagine that those bullets are the sort of starting scaffold. And then once we start the conversation, as I said in the chat, because author's notes are among other things, a conversation between the writer and herself, between the writer and the reader's responders, that conversation starts to take on a life of its own. And so, you know, you can take th those, those training wheels, I guess you can definitely sort of take off later because now you've, now you've got something else propelling you besides bullets. Like you're having hopefully a conversation that, that is meaningful. So next slide, please. Um, so when I first learned to use author's notes, I, I just wanted to sort of describe kind of an evolution in my thinking about author's notes, because I think there's a lot of different ways you can use them and try them and see how they work and like have your own evolution about how they might work. Um, 
initially I, I used them and I think, you know, I don't know if this was my failure of imagination or how I was taught. It's just a supportive or a service text. The author, the, the real text is the poem draft. The author's note is to like serve the poem draft, which I don't want to say is entirely untrue, but that was that was sort of the limit of its function. Like it it's it ranked second, a distant second in importance to the poem itself, the product. Um, and it has been evolving for me and my my students use of it over the years, largely because of the ways in which I've seen students use them into more of a central text or a text on its own merits. And this is hugely important because um, it's where it's where the learning <laughs> The learning is in both places. The learning is in the poem draft and the learning is in the writing about the poem draft, but that the metacognition is happening in the author's note. And and if if a sort of a basic sort of not controversial tenet of writing pedagogy holds true, right? That it's not about the writing, it's about the writer. And in that sense, each piece and each author's note is sort of really about the piece that hasn't been written yet, like the writer of the future and how they, how they, you know, keep becoming <laughs> that person, uh, that writer. So I think the, that author's notes really serve that that future. And like, because of that, I, I I've been in a place the last couple of years of trying to rethink how I how I communicate that importance without while dealing with sort of my concerns about the diminishment of the importance of the poem say right because like the poem is really important too like uh it's a false it's a false choice of course <laughs> um i also started out thinking about author's notes as a conversation between you the author of your draft and me the reader of your draft the central primary reader of your draft who's going to evaluate it um as as evolving more into sort of the beginning of an ongoing conversation about yourself or sorry a conversation with yourself about your work and your writerly habits and that it's also part of a larger ongoing conversation about like what is poetry what is a poet um and then another evolution here author's notes as being about the text evolving into author's notes as being about the writer like that so all of these movements that are not discrete they're all kind of overlapping i just basically used this slide to sort of try and work out in an abbreviated sense the different tendrils of my evolution um again largely fueled by the way students have been using author's notes the last few years um so phase one was like author's note is just this individual discrete conversation starter functional service text Phase two, well, gosh, at the end of the semester, you hand in a final portfolio of revised work and you write a narrative in which you say, here's the poems I handed in, here's what I did with them, and here's how it's learning. Like, here's what I learned. Author's notes in my phase two became this source of <laughs> evidence, kind of. Um, I would tell the, the, the language I often use to explain it to English majors was like, imagine you're writing an essay about an author and you're looking at the primary, the primary texts, which are the, the, the things the author wrote. And you're looking at the secondary texts, which are the author's notes. Like you're writing an essay about an author and the author is you. <laughs> like, so you have not only the poems to look back on, but also this, this hopefully this thread, you know, what is it that you kept saying over and over again in your author's notes? Like, what question did you keep returning to? What new thing did you start noticing or, or spending time with in your author's notes? And how might you use that end of semester reflection to kind of gather some of that? And then where I am right now is I'm really wanting to do more with reflection on learning like I like I'm and I don't know I don't know what this is going to mean exactly I'm still very much in process about it like I think I don't know if it was Martha or somebody when I was talking about this dilemma and like wanting to make the author's notes sort of more central and the and the final course narrative where they talk about their own work like more central it's like well how what percentage of the final grade is given to that right and the way I had historically been grading these pieces still made that sort of 
the primary text primary, right? Because of that percentage. And it's, it's, I've felt a lot of resistance in myself to, sh to shifting too much, right? I, but that it, all of it sort of reveals to me my own existing and enduring um, assumptions and investments in like grades, percentages as being the communicator of meaningfulness. <laughs> which it has to be something else. Um, yeah, so uh, final slide, and I think I should be able to finish up. I have so many things that I just want to think about and talk about based on just the beginning of this presentation, but I will move on. So my current goals, like this is where I am right now, kind of with author's notes and self-assessment. I, I need, I want and need to spend more time teaching the form, the genre, the potentials of the author's note. Like, <laughs> I've never, we've never workshopped author's notes, which itself seems sort of like, why would you do that? But well, if it's, if we have an idea about why you, you know, workshop any text, like, why wouldn't you workshop an author's note, right? Um, so I'm interested in how, in, in other ways, not just workshopping, I might teach and reinforce this idea that this is, it's important. It's meaningful. And, and it's not something that you automatically are able to do. It takes practice. It takes, you know, time. Um, and I, and so I want it to, I don't want it to just be a sort of a tack on or a PS that, that always exists to serve the quote unquote real work. Um, and I think this will involve revisiting and reiterating author's notes importance and function over the course of the semester in various ways Two, that the, the workshopping is just sort of the low hanging fruit because like we're doing that anyway. So that might be a familiar space in which to kind of legitimize the, the author's note as real and important. I have a link in this slide to, and it's my spring 2021 author's note syllabus language for my comp and advanced comp courses. It's slightly different from my creative writing course, just because of the genre differences. I mentioned earlier that learning letters, if you're Googling around on this and you Google author's notes, you'll find a bunch of stuff. And I think learning letters is a, is a thing that you'll find a lot on as well. And this is so old, like this, none of this is new. I, I hope that some of my thinking about it is new though. Um, author's notes can be tailored to specific assignments or learning goals uh, and can be, be very specific or very general. For example, when I ask students to uh, use assonance and consonants, I ask them to write poems that have big um, audible sound effects, but do not use full end rhyme. That's the one thing they're not allowed to use for this one poem, right? I have a reason for doing this. I want them to see that there are options <laughs> to full end rhyme when you wanna like make your poem sound cool. So um, I ask in the, in the assignment prompt, I'll say in your author's note, please describe which of the sound effect techniques that we discussed that you used and how you found that to be. Like, you know, how did it compare to using full end rhyme, whatever. Um, and you can certainly do this with all kinds of writing assignments. Like what was, what was difficult to you about the primary source research for this, you know, essay? Um, describe your experience using, um, uh, I don't know, using hypothesis to comment on this. Um, and then one last note and I'll get out of here. I, I have in the past and I and I, I want to sort of think more about how I might reincorporate this, not necessarily into daily author's notes, but the idea of creating acknowledgements of, of having an opportunity, um, maybe more toward the later um, iterations of a, of a draft or a project to thank people, to acknowledge like, here's, not just like here's my writing process, which is important, but also here's who helped me. I got I got some really helpful peer response on this section from so and so. Um, you know, the librarians helped me figure out this. My mom and I had a great conversation about this. Like acknowledgments, like you'd read in a book, <laughs> um, as a way of. I mean, it's not unrelated to citing your sources, right? But it's a way of emphasizing the sociality and commun communality, com communism? <laughs> um, but it's a way of emphasizing the communism of, of learning. Um, so love talking about author's notes, love talking about all of these sort of impossible, delicious, wonderful things. Thanks for asking me. I will now take a breath. Thank you, Liz. I'm going to go ahead and invite <coughs> Matt to um, join us now.
Hello. Hi, everybody. I'm Matt Cheney. I'm Director of Interdisciplinary Studies here at Plymouth State. Uh, and I'm in my third year of doing that. Previously, Robin DeRosa uh, had that position, which I mentioned just because some of the things I'm going to share with you are um, deep reiterations of things that I think Robin first created and, uh, and some of which she uh, admittedly also borrowed from elsewhere. So there's, there's a long lineage to some of this stuff. Um, I have been teaching for a while and have taught in a, a variety of different circumstances, uh, including uh, 10 years teaching high school, mostly English and theater. And I mentioned that because I was thinking about where did I start doing self-assessments? And, and it came from a very practical need, which was at, when I was a young teacher, I was um, taken aback by some students who were shocked by their grades. Um, not in the sense of like failing anything, but rather the student who got a B plus and was crushed because they expected an A. Uh, and I didn't really, as a young teacher, know what to do with that. And so what I, I decided to do was create some self-assessment. So at least I'd have a warning beforehand um, for those students to see what their expectations of grades were. Um, so things have evolved a lot since then, and my practices have changed um, very significantly. Um, but the thing that I keep coming back to is the, the what I really learned once I tried to use self-assessments as a real tool within the class beyond just information was that it takes practice because one, students don't get a lot of practice with it, but also there are uh, skepticisms within students that are, are well justified by their experiences of teachers uh, not valuing or uh, turning self-assessments actually against them at, at times. So there is a good strong reason for students' skepticism of these things and working with that is important. So what I always remind myself, especially at the beginning of the term like right now, is that self-assessment takes practice, practice both for the students and for the teacher, because in some ways, especially in those early self-assessments, what we're doing is sort of sussing each other out. They're trying to figure out what I want and what I'm like as a teacher. I'm trying to figure out what their experiences and background and assumptions are as students. So if we move to the next slide, I'm going to share some stuff here. And I'll try to put the link in the chat while that's coming up. Yeah. So all of the materials in much more detail and context are available on uh, the website for the course. Um, and as I was thinking about this presentation, I, I wanted to, to ground it within one specific course, because I think that for me at least, self-assessment practices are different course by course, because different courses have different needs. Um, that posed some challenges. Uh, first is I, I had trouble identifying what was self-assessment and what, what was just the work we do in class. My classes are, have lots of reflection within them. So I've, I've pulled out some things that may or may not fit what you think of as self-assessment as we go forward, but hopefully they're useful. Um, also, there's a big challenge, which is that I no longer teach classes graded A through F. All of the courses I teach are graded pass or no pass. That opens up all sorts of freedoms for um, freedoms for and freedoms from grading. Uh, so the self-assessments may be a little different than I would use them in uh, when teaching an A through F class. So first off, um, as I was thinking about what are self-assessments in my courses, the first is actually a, some, a fairly common practice, which is the survey in the first week to find out what students like for their names, um, what their experiences of the past were, et cetera. Um, and this isn't something we would typically think of as self-assessment, but as I was thinking about it, I thought that the decision to make choices about how you present yourself to effectively a stranger, that is your new teacher, involves some self-assessment. You have to make some choices about what you're going to share and, and what is important to you in, sh in that sharing. Um, this is also great because um, like many of the best self-assessment practices, it's super low stakes. There, is, there are virtually zero stakes for this. Students can put whatever they want. It has a no effect whatsoever on their grades. Um, we can move to the next slide. So here's, a, here's just an image of, of what mine looks like. I use Microsoft Forms now just because it integrates pretty well with some of our different systems. Um, I've used Google Forms um, plenty of times as well. You could do it as a quiz or a survey within your learning management system. You use SurveyMonkey. There are a billion different ways to do that. It's all um, very simple. Next slide. 
So throughout the term, um, we do various sorts of reflection activities, starting small and starting, as Liz said, as, as, and as Martha said, starting with things that are very focused and structured. Um, because my assumption going in is that most of my students are um, probably don't have a lot of experience with self-assessment and perhaps are wary of it. Um, so I try to, to make them really focused, really structured at the beginning, working toward what is ultimately a very open self-assessment at the very end. So all of these initial assignments are short, reflective writing. Um, and usually the first ones you get are not very good by, you know, by what I would call good self-assessment. They're thin, they're tentative, the students are testing the waters, and they're, they're learning sometimes a whole new way to think. It's like, what should I be saying here? Um, so my feedback then is always super supportive. Um, I will, even if they hand in like three words, I will say, this is great. Okay, could you perhaps maybe in the in the future let's think about how some of this works for you. This is great. Keep up, keep doing it. Um, because I don't want to discourage them from this work. I don't want them ever to feel that oh no, self assessment. I have to monitor myself. And I also want to encourage them to dig deeper. Um, so always, what I'm asking them are questions of why and how. Um, why did, why is it this for you? How did you do this, etc. Not because that's really going to even help their grade. Again, mine are pass, no pass courses. They could do terribly on all of these, and they'd, as long as they did the work, they'd still pass. But I'm actually interested in what they have to say. I care about these assignments. I care about their work. Um, so I'm really curious. And often the, the, these sorts of reflection activities are some of the most interesting things I get in the term. OK, could we move forward? I feel I, I really want to beep like old film strips. Do you remember film strips? <laughs> Some of you are probably not as old as I am. It's like like old audio, like uh, old kids books with the yes. pages and the beep, and you know to yes. turn the page. Yes, and you can do that. I will uh, <laughs> put the slides if you beep at me. Um, okay, so here's just an example. Um, so by midterm, my goal by midterm is that they can do a pretty good self-assessment by midterm. Not great, but pretty good. They're, re they're ready to think this way. Um, so here I'm just giving you what my midterm self-evaluation is. It's simple. It's five questions. Um, and it's really just asking them about where they are with stuff in the course. It's A lot of it's informational for me. You can move to the next slide. Um, so you can see it starts from just, you know, have you, gotten some, have you got some of the important work done or not? Um, but then it gets into things like talk about your overall performance. This is where we're moving toward that more general thinking. Um, and I don't just say, you know, talk about the overall performance. I give them some ideas. Have you completed the assignment? Have you attended class? Um, but then also try to avoid um, going that in a judgmental way, but then what's preventing you? What are the obstacles? Um, because this is midterm, we can fix things still. And that's how I often pitch it to the students is, hey, we've got half a term left. Um, even if things are blowing up in your face, we can, we can clean up. Um, and then finally, it ends with a very open question of, is there anything that I can do to support them as we continue in this class? All right, next slide. Then we do, there are some individual self-assessments on assignments and stuff as we move forward, but the, that we're really working toward, and essentially the whole class is building toward the final exam, which is nothing but self-evaluation. Um, so, and again, this comes from the luxury of pass, no pass. Um, I've done a similar thing in A through F courses in the past, because again, I always wanted to know what students um, expected or thought um, they should have for their grade. Um, but here, I'm really just asking them, um, you know, to, to think back on what they've done and to, because a, a term is long and they're able to, there's a lot of stuff from particularly the beginning of the term that they've completely forgotten. They've been in the weeds of their recent projects and things. So to really think about the course as a full term. Next slide. I think is the big ugly one. Yes, this is the big ugly one. Um, so you'll have a, a link to this presentation. So even if this is too small to read right now, um, or you don't want to read through it all, that's totally fine. The text is in the slides, um, the slide notes, uh, if you access this, uh, this presentation. Um, so this is the final exam. It's kind of an essay. 
Um, it gives them some things to do because I don't want them just, you know, roaming around completely free range uh, stream of consciousness. So there are some th things that I want them to do, but it gives them a lot of openness for how they do this. And my, my surprise, the first time I gave this, it, it was really an experiment. I had never done an entire final exam as just self-evaluation before. I thought it could be a... Mm, a real disaster. <laughs> uh, and so I was wonderfully surprised because the students, I, I thought they would, you know, sit down there, write a few few words and be done in 10 minutes. And occasionally one or two are. But in general, this exam usually takes them an hour to an hour and a half. And that is, to me, the, the sign of something going right here. Because um, for students to take the time to write an exam that that clearly actually has no bearing on their grade um, and to write this and reflect so deeply on their work and, and most importantly at this point not just what they've done but how they're going to carry it forward because that transfer is so important. Um, next slide. So this just tells you that this shows you how irrelevant to their grade it is. It's all about whether they want feedback or not. They just need to do it. Um, so they can turn this essay in, in in one of two ways. If they want a response, they can put it in a way um, that I can can uh, get to it, and because we do this all online, uh, and then I will leave a comment for them. If they don't care about a response, then all I need is proof that they did it, and they're good to go. Um, and it usually is about half and half for the students who want feedback and the students who don't. But that puts it all all in their court. Um, they can decide whether they want feedback and it works really well for me because it gives me the time to not have to give feedback on every single one but to prioritize the students who actually want it or say they do <laughs> um can we move to the next slide is there a next slide yes okay so here's a summing up um Lots of opportunity for almost no stakes practice, even when I'm playing, even when I'm teaching A through F courses, um, especially starting out, it's got to have virtually no stakes so that they can have, feel the freedom to, to play around. Um, the self assessment is integrated into the course assignments. It's never really an extra, it's just how we work, it's what we do. Um, it's why I had so much trouble sort of pulling out what is. Uh, self-assessment within this course, because almost anything that we do has a component of self-assessment to it. They also aren't just about the self. This isn't about creating a bunch of narcissists. This is about the course, what's going well, so that I get feedback too. Um, it's designed for, to be informational for me and for them. It's, it's not just self-assessment, it's also kind of self-regulation, um, both for the student and the course. Um, and then small assessments work toward larger. Similarly, uh, specific and directed assessments then work toward the more general and the open, such as that final exam. All right, I think that's what I've got for you. Thank you so much, Matt. Um, that was fantastic. I'm gonna suggest we break here just for a minute and see if there are any questions um, from folks in the Zoom room. I have a couple other slides in case there's nothing to talk about, but I have a there's... feeling people will have things to say. Yeah, people may want to um, unmute and jump in, but there are two things that I've been keeping track of in the chat that um, you, you three might want to speak to. Um, the first was a comment early on, uh, I believe from Nathan, about um, actually, so you guys were talking about, you know, sometimes people overestimate their the quality of their um, work or engagement. Um, but we also find students doing the opposite pretty mm -hmm. often, like being too harsh or harsher um, on themselves. We're wondering if you have had that experience and if so, um, what you think that's about to sort of counteract the other thing that they might do, which is, you know, overestimate how well they're doing. Um, so there's that question. The other one was more about um, faculty self-assessment and uh, how you may or may not use these tools um, in your own work as a teacher, whether they're related. Um, so if, I don't know if anyone wants to speak to either of those things. Well, I think Liz should talk about what she shared in the chat about faculty self-assessment. I, I had a couple of questions about that too, Liz, because that, I, is that a common thing? I've never heard of that before. Have I've you... only been to three places. <laughs> <laughs> My master's anybody. program, we didn't do it. <laughs> My PhD program, we did. Here, when I first got here, they were like, 
it was a little looser around the evaluations. You designed your own course evaluation, right. which was great in many yeah, ways. That's nice. You know, sometimes a little frustrating because like if you were trying to look at sort of programmatically stuff, it was yeah. a little idiosyncratic. But um, it so I only I don't know if this is popular or not or common. But I loved it. I loved it. Like it was, and, and part of what I loved about it, and I don't think I was clear about this, is so we do these paper evaluations, and you know, I wasn't allowed to touch them because that would keep them safe for me, my undue influence or whatever. So a student would pass them out, I would leave the room, and I would take my little sheet with me, and I would fill that out while they were filling theirs out. And I loved the tandemness of that, and that they saw me doing that. Like I'm yeah. going to fill out my evaluation now. Um, and you had to do it out, you had to leave so you weren't like staring at them while they were doing evaluations, which seems fine. And so then I would give my evaluation to the student who was collecting all the evaluations once I'd been given permission to re-enter the room. And then I didn't like, and then it was like a month and a half later that I would get that back. And that time, mm -hmm. like rather than waiting, like so the other, the, the opposite practice or the different practice is like, okay, the students do the course evaluations. You're just trying to get through finals week. And like, I stop thinking about the class. <laughs> and then a month and a half later, I get these course evaluations and I'm like, that I miss, I should just do it. Like, I don't, there's nothing stopping me from doing it. Like I miss having that snapshot of what I was thinking on the last day of the semester right, which is different sometimes than what I'm thinking or sure. feeling a month and a half later after I've done grades, after I've, whatever. So um, yeah, I really liked it. I, my memory is that all faculty did it and it was not, it was not a piece of like, it, like a formal evaluation. It was, it was an expectation. It was a cultural thing and it was super helpful. That's really interesting. It makes me think too about like what it would be like if when you got to those if you're doing self-evaluation in a class with sort of um, formal stopping points when you do it, if you like turn over to the class and said, okay, now you come up with a set of questions for me to evaluate my work in this class. And then you fill that out like and that. they could read and comment on your evaluation. I mean, talk about democratizing. That's, I don't know. <laughs> that's yeah. scary, but super cool. <laughs> Matt, did you have something else you were gonna say? No, I was just going to say in terms of the students who are highly negative toward themselves, I would say that is me. As, um, <laughs> as Martha was talking about employment self-evaluations, uh, I'm in the midst of doing pre-tenure review right now. Um, and so I always have to overcome my innate uh, a tendency for self-flagellation uh, uh, and, and shock at anything ever going even marginally well. So uh, I was that person in the, a few times as a student when I had to do self-evaluations. Um, I was always, you know, one, I would sort of meta approach it and say, I don't know how I would, how I would judge myself against other students not having that information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but for the most part, I would then really pitch it low because of uh, innate personal um, uh, brain things, I suppose. Uh, but I have not seen a lot of that in my own students typically because of how we start, which isn't really a assessment stuff, it's informational, it allows me to give them feedback. And then because we're taking small steps and I'm giving feedback along the way, um, the feedback is typically to try to keep them thinking about the things that and questions that matter and giving them a context. So I think when it's contextual, when it's not just, you know, how do you compare to other students, um, you can sometimes work uh, against some of those, those innate tendencies, but inevitably there are students who definitely way underrate themselves. And so the joy of feedback then is saying, you know, be nice to yourself. Yeah, definitely. I would say that in my experience with self-evaluation, I have a lot, I either have students who underrate themselves or I have students who just don't say anything terribly substantive in their evaluation. I very rarely have students who like try to trick me <laughs> into thinking they've, like it's hard, you can't do that, you know, like, cause we, I've seen what you've done. And I will say that like, there's nothing more joyful to me than reading self-evaluations from students who've been too hard on themselves and being able to say, no, that's, you know, you're, you're being too hard on yourself, right? Like it just, it feels like such a gift to be able to say, no, I'm an, I'm an, an observer of your work and I can tell you that you've been doing great things and this is what I've really enjoyed. Um, Cause I just don't think they've had that experience necessarily in that way. 
Um, it looks like there's a question from Lisa. Yeah. yeah. Um, that she says, can you speak to self evaluations that are, as Matt was talking about, comparative? I worked harder than other people. Or the other really common one, just based on effort, right? I worked so hard. Um, so, Liz, what do you think about that? I think that I've been, although I find it kind of a hissy mouthful, been really leaning on the word assessment rather than evaluation. And it, and that's partly in line with like the lar one of the larger projects of the writing classes I teach, which has to do with critique both of your own work and someone else's work, which is I think students need lots of help and writers need lots of help practicing description. Like I have many students who are ready to be like, this is a great piece. Even students who are ready to be like, this is a great piece. And and because of this one, because I really like, you know, this really reminds me of whatever. And I spend so much time, worthy time, central time, pushing back and being like, no, no, no. My students make fun of me for it, actually. Um, I don't know if Hannah Dutch <laughs> remembers this at all, but um, like I would in workshopping sort of be like, look, don't say I like, say I notice. Like, say I notice. We cannot talk, we literally cannot have a conversation about this, like, like, dislike, good, bad. And like, you know, and so my students, you know, sometimes getting tired and, and in a loving way, making fun of me would be like, I notice that I really like this. <laughs> and, you know, it's fine. It's all part of the classroom culture. But I guess what I want to say in terms of the evaluation is like, I don't want students comparing themselves to each other. Like, I, it, to me, it's the assessment is like appreciative, it's descriptive, which is not to say there's no evaluation because, you know, damn it, there's a grade at the end of this. But I definitely don't want them comparing themselves to other students. And effort is slippery. Effort is, I mean, I, I welcome that, like that I'm a little more interested in hearing about. But I mostly I want to hear them describe what they did and what that looked like and what it felt like and how it helped them or didn't help them learn what. Um, so I, I guess I just wanted to respond by saying like, maybe it matters, maybe it doesn't, the difference between the word assessment and the word evaluation. Um, Abigail, question or comment? Yeah, so I got a little bit of both. I was, um, thank you so much to everyone who spoke, by the way, it's been really helpful. I'm ungrading, as I said in my intro for the first time this semester, uh, but I have, but I'm, I come from a public, I'm a public historian and public history has self-reflection as a critical part of our practice. Uh, and we teach it, like there's whole books about it and we talk about it all the time. And so I've done a lot of that, particularly in my public history classes. And I usually frame it around, I give students kind of a, a definitional question uh, where they have to write an essay basically about like, what is public history? And they have to tell me and they have to cite a certain number of things that we've read. So it's, it's the goal here of making it no, it's not meant to be like about your feelings, right? That like, I like this, I don't like this aspect of it, but it's meant to be about like, how would you explain, how would you define this? How has your understanding changed over the course of the semester? How the things that we've read, you know, reading all the things we've looked at, how does that change what you think this is? Um, what you thought it was at the beginning and what you think it is now. Um, and that focus kind of on growth and shift. And, and so it's been really helpful to, um, I think particularly what, what Matthew was saying about how like framing out these questions and what I've been, what's been really helpful for me is sort of getting a sense of how to do that with things that aren't a public history class and how to do that with students taking research methods or students who are in senior seminar where I want them to evaluate their own growth um, but they don't have like a blanket question they can ask. And so I just wanted to say, I thought, I thought that was really helpful and constructive. And I didn't know if like that version of um, self-assessment might be helpful to think about for other folks. I see a raised hand from Jennifer, do you wanna go next? Yes, hello, thank you, Robin. And thank you to uh, Matt and Liz and Martha for your presentations. Um, my question is, so like Abigail, I'm also doing ungrading for the first time this semester, and uh, I just kind of jumped into the deep end of the pool with it and just decided I was going to go for it. And um, so it's in research methods in the criminal justice uh, uh, major. And one of the things that I've asked the students to do is a weekly journal of you know, what sort of problems they encountered during the week in finding um, articles to 
write about. Um, they have to find articles related to a particular research topic, which they can choose. Um, but just any difficulties they encountered with doing their research that week, what went well, um, kind of also to just document what they actually did that week for the class. And so that's kind of a form of self-assessment. But my question really is, are do any of you have some suggestions for um, like, just starting points, because I think students are going to need some direction for their weekly journals. I've tried to give them a list. I, I gave them a list of about 10 questions that they could think about and respond to in their journal. But um, in terms of trying to increase their capability over time in doing their self-assessment, um, are there some good kind of basic questions that could be uh, good starting points for students? I mean, I think there there are there are lots of really good basic questions, and and some of them may be ones that you've already um, landed upon with with the list that you said that you've um, you've identified. The thing that comes to mind as I listen to you talk that's such a great opportunity is because you're asking them to do this weekly. You really, um, I wouldn't actually obsess at all about how good they are in week one. You're because right. they're probably not going to be great yeah. <laughs> because they're just they're just getting their legs under them in terms of the assignment in terms of the course and in terms of understanding what it is you're looking for um what you have such a great opportunity for though is to establish sort of a feedback um loop and a conversation with them on a weekly basis it would be really interesting as like some people have talked about in other practices of maybe having them at some point have to go back and look at some of their at an early entry and reflect upon how they feel about the research process now compared to how they felt about it in week one or week two. But I think anything that you can do to kind of respond to these early weeks to guide them to where you're hoping they can get to is really what's going to benefit them long term. And if you think of that as a process and a journey that they're on, um, again, I think you have a, a really nice opportunity because of the weekly nature of that. Liz, did you have something else you were gonna? Yeah, I just, um, <laughs> I wanna um, very quickly, uh, so we finish on time, say that maybe later in the journals, you could have, like you said, you wanna ask them like what struggles or what problems they were having. Maybe a little later on, it'll be time to ask, so what did you figure out this week that you think might help other people in this class? Like what quick workaround, what cool source, what like awesome database and, and how might those workplaces not just be about sort of addressing like struggles or failures, but also like victories and like um, being able to help each other through those. Okay, yeah, I like, I like that idea. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, people want to keep talking. I am going to suggest that I first stop the recording. Hold on. <laughs>